I found it very surprising that developers found it surprising that AI could do so much of their jobs. I think <laughs> to me, that's exactly the root of the problem and exactly what I'm talking about when I say 70% of the code you write is nonsense. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Dear Digital podcast. My name is Sam, and I will be your host today for a discussion with Mo Hashimi from Gadget. Gadget is a full-stack serverless platform for building web apps fast and with the lowest possible maintenance. Their goal is to set up, ship fast web apps, or web apps fast, better said, um, and to make sure that people, developers, spend uh, zero time on repetitive tasks so you can focus on building the cool shit. Mo's experience is impressive. He was an early Shopify uh, employee, so please stick around for some internal, very interesting um, Shopify um, yeah, stories. Um, and he has built some seminal features within Shopify, such as Shopify Payments and Shopify Capital, as you will probably all know. Uh, so he knows the platform um, very, very well, uh, its founders and also its ecosystem. Um, this promises to get uh, a very insightful discussion, so hopefully you enjoy it as much as I did. Let's dive into it. Hello, Mo. Thanks a lot for joining our podcast. Let's establish yeah. the basics first. Uh, who are you? What do you do? And why do you do it? Uh, hey, Sam. Thanks for having me. Uh, so my name is Mohamed. Uh, I go by Mo. Um, I am the CEO and co-founder of Gadget. Uh, it is a app development, uh, and hosting platform, uh, that essentially kind of lets software developers build web apps, uh, incredibly quickly with a focus on apps on the Shopify platform today and a few other platforms, uh, that we've launched recently. Uh, I have been, uh, in tech my entire career. I do it cause I enjoy it. Uh, specifically, I uh, am on the kind of product side, uh, so building software. Um, uh, I've been doing that uh, at various uh, tech companies, big and small, for uh, over a decade. Um, I think that answered all three of your questions, but I'm not quite sure, so I'll just pause that, there. That's uh, more or less, I think, what the, the question was about indeed. So how did you arrive in the tech sector? Like, are you a developer? <laughs> did you? What did you study? Um, uh, I studied biochemistry in school and, um, I never finished school. I didn't really enjoy it. Um, I got a job while I was in school at a, uh, payment processing company, uh, internet company that was doing payment processing. And, uh, that was kind of my introduction into tech and, uh, that grabbed my interest. So I stopped going back to school. I took the job there. It became a full-time job. Uh, initially it was business systems analysis. So it's kind of like writing software requirements, really technical requirements. And this is back in the day before agile. So very like water file style, uh, software development company. And, um, and eventually the CTO of the company, uh, I was kind of writing requirements for a fraud detection system. Uh, he kind of approached me and said, you know, uh, we could use someone like you on more projects and we can give you this title called product manager. Uh, are you interested? And I didn't know what a product manager was. So I went home and Googled what is a product manager <laughs> and do I want this to be my career? Uh, cool. And I, I, I liked the description I read and I did that at that company, weirdly kind of reporting to the engineering organization. But then that turned into, you know, more product management roles at various other companies after, uh, I joined Shopify right after that as a PM, uh, one of their first product managers kind of working on their uh, financial services team. So Shopify payments was my first baby there. Um, my role changed over time there as well. By the end of it, I was kind of leading the financial services team, uh, building Shopify payments, shop pay, checkout, checkout API, like anything financial, Shopify capital, they were all kind of under one team, uh, that I was overseeing. Um, so product management has, has always been my go-to profession and I kind of landed in it by accident. Cool. How did you get in touch with the Shopify people? Uh, they found me at a conference we were both at. And, um, at the time, I think I was doing a talk about a specific topic that I knew a lot about, which was like how to 
underwrite because you have to like uh, approve a merchant for payment processing and that act is called underwriting. Uh, how to underwrite in real time because at that point in time a lot of uh, the payment processors and banks it was like submit your documentation and then in two to seven days we'll tell you if you're going to get payment processing. Nowadays with Stripe and Braintree it's very much like sign up to start processing and that is a whole complicated set of software that needs to meet compliance requirements and whatnot. So I was doing a talk about that. Shopify was, they had a head of product present and they knew they were going to start building a payments product and they wanted someone to kind of lead that team. So they approached me after and we just started talking and, uh, and then I joined, yeah, three or well, four months later. The whole payment processing thing in Shopify, I mean, it's quite a big deal. I just watched um, the little podcast of the All In podcast. They did like a conference and Toby Lutke was there, like the founder and CEO of Shopify, right? And he was talking about everything payment related and that that was like a huge thing for them in terms of uh, gaining efficiency for the merchants that were going to yeah. build on Shopify. Um, so can you just say something about like in that period okay. why did they want to do it how did they look yeah. at it uh, what was the issue necessarily like for people to understand because now people probably take it for granted but back then it was quite the topic right yeah it was a big deal and uh i, I would say like the whole there's a whole buzzword of like embedded finance and maybe shopify payments in shopify in 2013 was like the first example of like a very successful embedded finance product so um, yeah, the, the reason behind it was exactly what you said. I think a lot of people think like it's really a revenue play for Shopify. And obviously that's a great, uh, part of it, but the actual motivation for starting the payments team at Shopify was that the core business back then largely was focused on SMBs, mom and pops, like under $100,000 brands that were starting from zero. And uh, most of these brands were being started by people who'd never started a business before. And if you can imagine like starting a e-commerce business, there's like 9 million things you have to do. Uh, you have to like build a product. The product has to be good. You have to find suppliers. You have to figure out distribution. You need support. You need a website. You need some technology. You need order management, all of that. So you're running around trying to do all of that and anything goes wrong. Usually like that's when entrepreneurs give up. So selfishly from Shopify's perspective, you don't want entrepreneurs to give up. You want as few sure. distractions as possible so that they can spend a hundred percent of their time on one or two things, build great products, sell them, provide customer support, not like what the hell is a payment gateway? Let me go read documentation for two days and call American Express and negotiate pricing and then call a bank because you can't call Visa MasterCard directly. You have to talk to a bank and like learn all these rules. And like, meanwhile, you're supposed to build a product, sell it and, and do customer support. Well, so for us selfishly, and Shopify Payments was the first of a series of products in a group called Merchant Services. The idea was there's all these other distractions that the business owner has to deal with that are leading to churn or leading to them abandoning their own dream, right? Like it's too hard. It's taking too much of my time. I give up and let's go tackle all of those. And the biggest one was obviously everyone needs to accept payments. 100% of new businesses need to accept payments or else it's, what are they doing? Yep. And they're all spending a day to four days talking to banks and Amex and whatnot and trying to set this silly thing up. This is in 2013. Like this is Stripe just launched. Braintree was brand new. You still had to talk to banks. Um, and so we were like, well, we can make that problem disappear. And so we set out to initially actually build out our own. Uh, and then just at the 11th hour, uh, very, very late in the game, this company called Stripe came out of nowhere and they were tiny. They were like 20 people back then. And, uh, they pitched us and we kind of liked what they were pitching and we decided to partner with them and build it with them. So that's kind of wow. how Shopify payments came to be. And the reason is primarily, um, like less churn for small businesses because there's one less gigantic distraction. They sign up to Shopify now, their checkout has payment processing. They don't spend three days reading documentation on what the heck is going on, what a good price is. They just get it. 
cool interesting yeah um so then you worked for a couple of yeah years i guess at shopify right yeah i was there till 2018 late to so five and five years maybe yeah. okay and then you started your own company gadgets like from the no, get-go I actually uh i did consulting for about a year and a half and um and not really working full-time, just kind of taking time off and doing that. And then afterwards, my co-founder, Harry, who was the seat, uh, sorry, uh, head of um, core engineering at Shopify, called me up and uh, pitched me an idea that eventually became the company Gadget. Um, so it wasn't right away. It was a year and a half later that, uh, that we finally decided to start a company together. Cool. So you are from Canada, right? Well, I'm born in Iran, and then uh, I was raised in Canada since I was four. Yeah. Okay. Can okay. you just like uh, describe a bit what Shopify did for the the cities in in uh, yeah. the tech cities in in Canada or like the Canadian technology scene as a yeah. whole? Yeah. I well, I think it just like gave Canada a flagship tech company that's you know one of the hundred biggest tech companies out there, and proved that frankly, like there's enough local talent to do it here as well because Shopify was largely built on just local talent uh, for a very long time. They would yeah. hire kids out of school and kind of like train them up to be as good as they are. And a big part of that was just like, it's not San Francisco here. This is Ottawa, Canada. It's a government city. 75% of the city works for the Canadian government. Um, and uh like it did the culture, the mindset, the work-life balance, the the tech culture isn't the same thing here. And so you kind of have to create your own. And they did a really good job of doing that or, uh, in their own little bubble. Once you joined, they would kind of like suck you into that world and teach you whatever you needed to learn. So it cool. did a lot for the tech community because then all those people now know what it takes and go off and do their own things or go join other companies and help them. Uh, it created a insane amount of wealth, obviously. Um, uh, just a lot of very rich people suddenly. And that money got in a lot of the, the early employees or angel investors, their investors in various LPs. They, a lot of them focus on like Canadian startups to invest in. Wow. So the money is circulating still. Um, yeah, I would say Shopify had a massive impact on the Canadian techies. Nice. Too. I think it so also that, acclimated people. Yeah. That, like probably like you as well, I guess. Right. I mean, exactly. Yeah. Just like seeing that you can do it here motivates you to try to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit more about your background? Like, did you, did you want to start a company when you were young already or wasn't that I, in your mind? I don't think at any point I would have said I, I want to start a company, but I think anyone who knows me would have been like, well, he started 50 companies. Okay. Uh, but to me, they weren't companies. They're kind of like projects. And, uh, and that's kind of the only situation in which I end up with a company is when I'm obsessed with a project and then it just becomes a company. So at the age of 13, um, for some reason, I decided I needed to build a uh, online jobs website to compete with Monster.com, if you remember Monster.com. And yep. uh, and I didn't know how to write code. I didn't know how to design. I didn't know anything about the internet. But what I was very good at was going on forums and convincing a designer and a developer to do it all for me for free. And uh, so I had a website, uh, it was called greenlemur.com, and that's now my gamer tag. You'll find it everywhere awesome. if you look for Green Lemur. And uh, it was a job board that no one was using, and it was live for about six months. And uh, that was my first business, and I have like 30 of these weird stories of just, you know, started a company, sold something for nine months, and then stopped doing that. Um, so very entrepreneurial, I would say, but mostly driven by like, I get obsessed with a problem or a project, yeah. and then that's all I want to do for a very long time. And that ends up being a company or something like uh, entrepreneurship. That's cool. typically how I end up in it. It's not like I sit down and I'm like, what's my next company? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. 
And so yeah. probably the ecosystem around Shopify propelled you as well in like doing gadgets. Uh, you also have some very, very nice investors. I think some early investors in Shopify are also invested in, in gadgets, right? Is that yeah, true? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, definitely just like the experience of building a lot of software is a, a big driver of gadget. It's just at some point you kind of see how much of the work you do is repetitive and nonsense and also what your salary is. And then you're like, well, why am I paid to copy paste stuff over and over again into a black screen? Um, and so de definitely, I think just the experience was a big motivating factor. The fact that we had resources we could raise money from, uh, Harley and Toby are investors in Gadget personally, uh, a lot of other executives at Shopify as well. And then uh, in our case, uh, what we're trying to build is a little heretic we're basically saying most of how you do software development is wrong. Here's a better way. And that's a little crazy. And so just our past experiences and reputations of the Shopify community made it so that we can go to market much more easily. It's like I used to run Shopify checkout and Shopify checkout scale. Then 3 million merchants were doing massive sales on it. And so you're more likely to trust me on day zero with a company like Gadget than if I was trying to sell it to a agency focused on Airtable. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so it gave us a good go to market path as well. Our focus is obviously longer term going to be much bigger than Shopify and we've already expanded a bit, but uh, a great starting base uh, where the community trusted us enough to give us a shot and that helped give us the the initial traction we needed sure. to go raise more money and find more traction and more customers cool maybe it's a good time to um dive into some of the tech more technical terms so obviously sure. i've been checking your website i know gadgets quite well um yeah. not i don't know everything but i i know it quite well obviously but this this podcast is not necessarily for two super tech minded people it's also yeah. for merchants on shopify and yeah. I just wanted to, now that you are here being such a like technical person in terms of you understand all of that stuff, can we just go through some definitions of the things that are on your website just to explain sure. them in a terms? I think it's super interesting for everybody. Um, like sometimes the developers and the community, they create a kind of a bubble where, where other people cannot necessarily get into. And I think it's super nice to just broaden it up. So yeah. I just had a couple of things that I wanted to discuss with you, like serverless infrastructure. What does it actually mean? Like boilerplate web apps maybe as well, because it's yeah. not a typical term that a lot of people, mer merchants like know what actually this yeah. is. I mean, they have seen it on screens and then zero maintenance. That's also yeah. something that I just wanted to talk to you like conceptually, <laughs> philosophically, maybe even like, how is that even possible? Yeah. Why do we say certain things in the technical yeah. community? Yeah. So uh, serverless, let's start with the first one. Serverless yep. just means uh, you don't manage and run your own servers. It's a bit of a misnomer. It doesn't mean there are no servers. There are Obviously. always servers. It used to be there. And servers, by the way, are just like computers that are hosting your software and your data. And uh, when you visit a website, you make a call to whatever server is hosting that website and that server sends back some data to you. Way back in the day, these servers used to be in your own closet. <laughs> and <laughs> since uh, we've all kind of moved to like three companies, really Amazon, Google, and uh, Microsoft have gigantic data centers with a boatload of these servers. And uh, we now own Almost everybody rents servers mm -hmm. from these companies. They are responsible for making sure the servers work, the servers scale. So all of a sudden, if your business grows and you start selling 200 million more orders than you did yesterday, that poor computer has to handle 200 million more order requests than it did the day before. And what serverless means is that you are renting some other engineering team doing that hard work for you. Cool. They have to figure out how the hell to go from one sale to 200 million sales overnight. Your engineers do not have to figure that out anymore. Yeah. That's serverless. You just pay for it and it scales with you. Exactly. Kind of like Shopify, right? exactly. And it's really great in e-commerce because like e-commerce has these bursty kind it's, of moments. Yep. And what's nice is like when you're selling a lot, the servers will increase their capacity. You pay more obviously for that. Yep. And then when your sales decrease, they just kind of decrease their capacity and you pay less. Like you're not just paying $400 every month, even if you make one sale or 100 million sales, it's like, it goes up with your, um, 
your actual usage and it comes down when your usage comes down. And so you kind of also have like a fair price based on your usage, not, you know, on November, you're getting a great deal because your sales skyrocket, yeah, but in January, yeah. your sales come down and you're getting a terrible deal. So okay. that's another big feature of serverless is the pl pricing is elastic. It goes up and down. Cool. Um, maintenance list in the context of gadget means a couple of things. <laughs> Typically, when people say serverless, they mean like the, the logic of your software. So let's say your software was uh, a, a custom carrier service that returned a shipping rate on checkout. It's going to execute some math, figure out a number, and then send that number back to Shopify. That that That's logic. That logic running is what uh, serverless handles for you. So some other engineer is responsible to make sure whether you call that logic once or 10 million times, it works. <laughs> Databases second part of software is like a place to store data and you call that a database so this is not about like the actual logic and the math but the numbers that are feeding into the math you know maybe like you're pulling a rate from fedex for uh, shipping to canada and you save that somewhere in a database and then when you need to calculate something you pull it from the database mm -hmm. databases also need to scale they also need to go from saving one record one order to 10 million orders serverless database is a new concept that few companies do gadget does it where you don't deal with the database scaling you don't deal with a, a, a job that's called indexing your database to make sure that when you're fetching data from it it's really fast gadget the company is doing all of that for you and then the third part of maintenance lists, and the reason we say maintenance lists and serverless separately is usually when people say serverless, they just mean logic. When we say maintenance lists, we mean your logic, your data, and then finally, the Shopify API. Every single Shopify app is um, with a backend is fetching some data from Shopify using their API. APIs are just uh, a way for two internet software is built by different companies to talk to each other. Yep. So when your app wants to talk to Shopify, it has to talk to Shopify through uh, tech, a set of technologies called APIs. Um, Shopify changes its API every three months and every 12 months as a, so a software developer building Shopify apps, you have to also change some things to stay up to date. And Gadget automatically updates the API version for you as well. And so that's a third part of what we mean by maintenance list. And ultimately, all of that means as a merchant, you are getting your projects completed faster for fewer hours, which means for less money. And then for the agency, it actually means more money because they complete more projects faster with the same yep. developers. So it's kind of a win-win where it's like you get a better deal on your project and the agency doesn't mind because they just fly through more projects because they don't yeah. have to maintain all these old ones as they grow, as Shopify changes its API, and ultimately you pay for that. And with Gadget, you kind of don't because the software takes care of all of it for you. Cool. Very nice. That helped a lot, I think, for a lot of people that maybe just boilerplate and yeah, yeah maybe web apps, but we will discuss. Yeah. Like boilerplate, maybe that's an interesting one. Yeah, so boilerplate is uh, means different things to different people in tech. For uh, the definition I use is broad. It is all of the bullshit. Apology for my language. Repetitive code that a software developer will write over and over again to build an application on the internet. Uh, the analogy I'd like to use is um, internet software is a very young industry. It's thirty, forty years old. That's nothing compared to other professions out there. And uh, as a profession, I don't think the tools we use for building software have really captured the patterns of the software we're trying to build. So like you walk out of the door, you see brick buildings and you see glass buildings. And you can imagine my expectation is people show up to a brick construction site, brick building construction site with bricks and a glass building construction site with glass because we've seen so many of these that we just know we need bricks and glass. In software, it's almost like we go to the construction site with sand every single time and we're like, hey, maybe we're gonna take the sand and convert it to glass and build a glass building. 
maybe we're going to take this and convert it to bricks, build a brick building. And my view is like, these patterns are so obvious now that maybe what we need is higher level tooling. Tools that are like, this is a tool for brick buildings. This is a tool for glass buildings. The two tools do not need to be the same. You don't need to start at the same low level. And that's what Gadget is. It's like a boilerplate free, all of the repetitive stuff you do to build brick buildings pushed down by us. We handle all of that for you. You handle what's unique about your brick building. The bricks are not unique. I guarantee that. Bricks are used by every building. And so that's kind of what we mean by like the sand is the boilerplate. Building yep. bricks from sand over and over again. You could be building a Shopify app, a yeah, toothpick store, a Magento app, a Airtable app. I don't even need to know what you're building to know that you need a database, you need a back end, you need a front end, you need these libraries, you need this infrastructure. And all of those motions a developer is going through, running these commands on their computer to spin up the same database again, build uh, a login form because, you know, every software on the internet has a login form over and over and over again. People pay for that time. <laughs> and I consider all of that to be boilerplate. If you're, waste building a, yeah, if you're building a Shopify app that's a fulfillment service, what's unique about it is the fulfillment logic. The database, yeah. the front end, the back end, how to talk to Shopify, all of that is nonsense. The only thing that is unique code that the engineer has to like really sit down and think, how am I going to calculate this, is the logic for the math for the fulfillment service. And then 75% of the rest of the code they write to make that app work is the same code to make a different app work as well and a different app and a different app. That is boilerplate to me. And to me, you push that down and you have the engineer focus their time on the 30% and the platform and the tool needs to figure out how to hand the developer the 70% in an extensible way, which is very tricky, but that's kind of our game is to do that. So you chose to build a lot on, I, I think on your website now, it's like you build Shopify th uh, things, build on Shopify, like apps and stuff, right? Public apps as well. That's like a big thing that we should discuss. Uh, it's not only yeah. for the custom, more private apps for certain stores. You really yeah. are the platform because yeah, just what you explained right now is very um, obvious and yeah. relevant for building public apps as well, right? Um, but like why is Shopify such a good system or platform to build on top of at this point yeah. in time? Um, they Because <laughs> people still think a bit of Shopify as like a closed off system that you don't necessarily can build on top of. So yeah. I think for those people, it's really weird that a platform like um, Gadget exists. Can yeah. you say something more about this? Did Shopify <laughs> change a bit? How is it changing in the future, you think? Like, how do you think yeah. about this? So I, I think... Um, Maybe I'm going to get a little too meta, but let me just like zoom. I think anytime anyone yeah. buys uh, SaaS software on the internet, so like um, Shopify, uh, Twilio, uh, maybe not Twilio, uh, Airtable, Notion, like you pay a monthly fee, you get a software to run some part of your business. What you're really doing is you're renting someone else's opinion on how a business process should run because it's very expensive to pay developers to build it all for you, right? So like this company called Shopify exists. It has an opinion on how to do product inventory management, website design, back office, all of that. It has built that opinion for you and it rents that opinion to you every month for $29, $2,000, whatever it is. When your business grows on these platforms, and it's not just Shopify, but any SaaS platform where you're building your entire business on top of it, it could be HubSpot, Salesforce, whatever. At some point, usually when you're at like one to three million in sales, there's a very specific business process that you need to behave differently from the platform. It's like your fulfillment workflow is slightly different and the Shopify UI is now annoying you because when you were doing $50,000 in sales, it didn't matter, but now you're doing a million and it's like a an extra two minutes every order. And that's a lot of money suddenly. And what happens is at that point, you kind of have a few options. Like you can go to an app store and look for an app that solves your problem. 
you can reach out to agencies or your own developers and say like, let's use Shopify's APIs, which are the extension points Shopify offers everyone to kind of like solve these unique problems for themselves yeah. and solve it for ourselves. Um, that, that ecosystem is thriving, by the way. So people talk about public apps and custom apps. Most Shopify apps are custom apps. You just don't see them because they're installed on one store. There's only yep. 9,000 public apps on the app store. Um, but that dynamic of my entire business is on this very opinionated platform actually makes it very conducive for app development activity. Because there's always going to be, there's 3 million merchants on Shopify. There's always going to be, a, I like what they do with their product information management, but I need it to be slightly different. I like yeah. what they do with order management, but I need it to be different. I need the data to go from this shuttle here to that shuttle there because I need that other software to handle this other thing for me. And it makes Shopify a very uh, good ecosystem for a constant stream of app development activity. And that's why we picked it. Yeah. Right? It's a good ecosystem for app development activity. The public app store, I would say, has maybe like slowed down a little bit in the last two years. Um, I think, uh, and that's probably just like the economy and the stock price. And when just, two entrepreneurs are looking for their next opportunity, they probably see Shopify stock price and they're like, oh, maybe I should go and do it on some other platform. But yeah. uh, but the custom app ecosystem seems to still be kicking and doing really well. And uh, so that's really kind of why we picked Shopify in the first place. And, and the second reason I already mentioned, very, very hard to build a product that is very new and very, very controversial, just telling people you're doing your job wrong. And uh, and so for us, we needed a community that started with a higher level of trust. And again, because I used yep. to work there and I had a bit of trust built in, that was the second reason to pick Shopify. But I would cool. say that there's a very big uh, app development ecosystem around Shopify, and I don't see the custom app side ever slowing down or disappearing just because it's the nature of renting SaaS and then growing and then needing customization. Maybe just to take a, a bit of a step back. So you were discussing like the 70, 30%, right? So if, if you build stuff, you don't want to be taking care of like the sand stuff, right? Which takes yeah. a lot of time. You just want to build cool stuff. So, I mean, probably that's extensible to the way also Shopify yeah. thinks about their SaaS platform, right? Because then they probably like in their minds, because maybe you can discuss it a bit more because you were you work there. Do they really think about this as like, I want to, we want to build stuff that is good for 80% of the people oh, or yeah. for merchants 80% of the time. And there is like a level that we cannot really even deliver because it would take yeah. us too much time, right? Do they really yeah. think about it that way as Absolutely. well? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Like you just did like there's 100, 200 countries, so many industries. The way to sell wine is different from the way to sell shoes that is different from the way to sell couches. There's no way Shopify can build one product that's perfect for everyone. So what they do is like, what is it that 80% of people need 80% of the time? That's our job. But then at the same time, can we give the ecosystem the extension points they need to do the other 20% for us. Yep. And that's always Shopify's mindset. Yeah. I didn't think about this too much. So maybe I'm, I'm really blattering something that is not true at all, but like does what you are now describing with Shopify and then maybe custom apps on top of it based on APIs also make sure that the whole ecosystem or tech stack that you have as a merchant really is more composable because Imagine that you then want to switch your Shopify layer to another commerce layer. Like compare this to like maybe a, a, maybe a, f a fully like o open source monolith that you can build stuff in towards. And then if you want to take it out because you want to switch to commerce layer, then you're yeah. actually stuck in the system because you build everything into the thing itself. Yeah. Is that is yeah. that something as well that lives There's, or is that not really it, true? It's definitely how it is with Shopify, but like the motivations of why and not everything. Like some of the like the API, if you're using one of Shopify's standard admin APIs to power your application, that's not a unique thing to Shopify. But like check out extension admin extensions; those are kind of sure. like unique Shopify concepts. And it you're did. right. Like if you want to leave, those are like you got to rethink all of those in whatever platform you're going to. But the reason they are the way they are, I think sometimes people are like, well, Shopify does this to lock us in. It, it has nothing to do with that. It's just like, 
um, in order to reduce the cost for every single business and make it so you can start a store with all of the features for a very, very low price of $29, Shopify deploys what it, we like what a developer would call like a multi-tenant approach, which means that every single store, every bit of logic, every front end, every back end is running on shared infrastructure. Yeah. And that is really, that's what makes Shopify platform. That's really tricky to do because um, the way, for example, the database works is when people are asking to read data from it, it slows down. Yeah. And so all of a sudden you have 3 million merchants with 3 million different stores with 3 million different code for front end and back end and app developers building apps. And some of the app developers are really good and some of the app developers are really bad and they're all in the same infrastructure and they're all trying to talk to the same database and Shopify promises every single merchant it will be fast no matter what you do no matter how yeah. bad your developer is you no know, yeah. like if the developer for the store next to you is terrible they can't slow your store down yeah. that is a really really big engineering challenge and the net result is that sometimes the extension points into Shopify are not standard APIs. They're kind of like, here's Shopify functions. Here's, you know, uh, admin UI extensions. It's like a little invention of Shopify. But usually, like, for someone who's kind of built these systems, you, you can tell the reason they have to do it is because those points in their system they need to really carefully control how any random third party developer can yeah. interact with it. Because if one developer interacts with those points poorly, they can hurt other people. And that's, that breaks the Shopify promise. The Shopify promises your store doesn't go down, even if the developer for the store next to you is terrible. Screws it up. Yeah. So it kind of turns into like, why did Shopify do like, Funk Shopify functions? Why did they do checkout extensions? Why don't they just give me HTML, CSS, and let me write whatever I want to write? Well, it's because they're running it on the shared infrastructure, and that sure. gives you a very low price. If they were running each store on separate infrastructure, your wow, bill wow. would be two or three times as high. Whoa. And uh, so the price comes down dramatically, but in an exchange, sometimes you have to learn Shopify's unique approach to customizing your store. And that can feel a little annoying. Yeah. I think that they're doing a bit of the same now with the login, right? So the, the checkout was fenced off for a while. Then they have all the APIs and extensions, et cetera. Now I think they're also moving to do this for the whole login ecosystem with um, mm -hmm. the magic link and stuff. So yeah. before you just had the option like the checkout.liquid before, and now you had the yeah. account system uh, liquid stuff. Can yeah. you say something about that? Like, how does it feel for you? What are they trying to do? I mean, probably it's just what I, you uh, were saying, right? I, but, uh, I'm sure they're just trying to make room for their own features. Yep. So um, I bet you, like, they're merging shop pay and customer accounts, and eventually yep. shop pay and customers kind of become this one fused concept. And maybe yep. when you're a shop pay user, you can log into any store, even if you've never logged in before. Yep. Maybe they'll do shop rewards inside the customer account where as soon as you log into the store, like, hey, you've never bought from this store. Here's shop cash. So that would be my guess. Customer accounts and shop pay and customers start kind of merging as a concept. And okay. merchants will probably really like that because it'll help increase sales uh, mm -hmm. where Shopify will use its own money to incentivize increased purchase behavior. That would be my guess. Nice. And uh, usually when the platform and the ecosystem, and I call you folks the agencies and the app developers the ecosystem, want to share real estate, it's really tricky because the platform needs its part guaranteed and untouched, and mm -hmm. then the ecosystem wants to touch everything. Mm -hmm. And so that's the, the tension is like, they then come out with a new API and it's like, sorry guys, this is our land. You cannot touch this land anymore. We have plans for what we want to do inside the land. Yeah, you are allowed to touch the land around it now. 
And I think that's what they've done with customer accounts is like they're carving out the land so they can start putting really cool things in their parts of that land. (laughs) But I mean, for, for gadget, this is interesting, right? As well, but because I mean, it's, yeah, it's all based on then what people can do with those for us. Anytime Shopify launches a new API, it's exciting. Yeah, you're like, yes. <laughs> new opportunity for more app activity, more ideas, <laughs> and uh, more customers for us. So, yeah, for sure, it's always great news for us. Nice. Okay. Um, maybe a broader topic, like the developer community as a whole, because, I mean, we cannot have a podcast these days without um, talking about AI as well. That, yeah. like, yeah, has a big impact on you as yeah. a as a as a as platform because now you're also focusing on AI specific uh, apps. Maybe yeah. we can talk a bit more about that because that's obviously super interesting. Probably a big growth uh, path for you guys yeah. as well. But also just maybe touch upon and then we can leave this behind. Like the developer community, the developers itself. How do you yeah. look at those? Probably the company exists like mostly developers work at your company. Yeah, yeah. I guess we're uh, um, we're twenty five people. I would say twenty two of us are technical. Even the ones who are on the marketing team are kind of technical, and then three mm-hmm. non technical. Um, I would say uh, so. First of all, I'll say that like I found it very surprising that developers found it surprising that AI could do so much of their jobs. I think to me, that's exactly the root of the problem and exactly what I'm talking about when I say 70% of the code you write is nonsense. Wow. What a developer tends to do is like, I don't remember all the syntax and like how to do X, Y, Z in every language I've ever learned. I can't remember it. So you're writing code, you open a new tab, you Google search, you read an article, you copy paste, you change it. (laughs) And a computer can Google search, find the right answer, and bring it to you much faster than you can. You're a human, your finger has to move, it has to click. It takes like 20 seconds to open a new tab, Google search, find an answer. But when OpenAI comes out and says like, well, behind the scenes, I can have a computer predict what you're trying to write, go read the entire internet, find the best answer it can find, and send it back to you. People are like, oh my God, it's doing so much of my job. Well, so much of your job was bullshit, my friend. You know, like you were copy pasting for half the time. Yes, a computer can take that away from you because a computer can do it faster, cheaper in milliseconds, not in minutes. Um, so I think that feeling of like developers feeling a little threatened to me, like it's a realization of how much of your job is boilerplate, that, uh, that a computer can kind of do it so much better and faster than you. I do think some of it is overblown. It's like there's a layer of code that I think AI can write really, really well, but there's a higher level engineering that's still not, it's still not good at architecture, data modeling, what infrastructure to pick, how to pair the infrastructure and the framework and all of that together. And I think developers who are feeling threatened uh, should push themselves to get good at the higher level engineering work, not writing code, because writing code is a lot of repetitive boilerplate monkey work, but architecture and, you know, like framework design and that kind of stuff. Like, AI is still not good at it. Maybe it will be in five years and no developer will have a job ever again. Who knows? But uh, <laughs> right now, what I consider it to be very, very good at is. Right. The same copy pasting we are doing as humans, well, a computer can do it faster than us. And <laughs> it is currently kicking our ass in the game of copy pasting the correct answer quickly into a screen. Interesting. Cool. So both with AI and then with Gadget, I mean, there was a lot of uh, efficiency to be gained, I guess. <laughs> That's yeah, yeah, mean. for sure. <laughs> it's, it's a very un- inefficient profession, I would say. Yeah. A very expensive and inefficient profession. Is everybody on the same page? I mean, in such a technical business, it's quite interesting to like have this view. (laughs) It's very weird because it's like you talk to any developer early in their 20s, straight out of school. It's like, I'm a software developer. I am the master of efficiency. I teach a computer how to make inefficient human processes efficient. And that's true to some degree, right? Like, Instead of pencil and paper, we have Excel sheets on the cloud and we can communicate with each other 10 times faster. Software developers build tools that make humans more efficient. Now, the tools software developers use themselves 
nonsense. And you talk to a developer at the age of 30, 35, their view changes. It's like, I wrote the same code over and over again. What am I doing with my life? You know, uh, I've built auth 15 times. When you're 22, you're building auth for the first time. You're like, oh man, this is cool. I'm learning a lot. I've never done this. I got to get it right. Security is important. When you're doing the 19th time as a 32 year old, your view has changed on the exactly. whole thing. And so I actually find that like, no one says what I say, but when I say it, you like a developer will not. A developer will be like, yes, my job is bullshit and I know it. <laughs> There's usually a divide like around the age of 25 over that. They nod and they're like, yes, I already can tell how much of my job is nonsense and how much of my job is like me thinking math and engineering. Uh, so I think not a lot of people say it, but I think a lot of developers know it to be true, especially the ones who've kind of been writing, building web apps for, let's say three, five years. And by the way, by web apps, yeah, I just mean a mobile app is an application that lives on your phone. A web app is an application that lives on an internet browser that you go to. So Shopify is a web app. Okay. You log into Shopify, you build your store with Shopify. It's a web app. And, well, uh, and that's what I mean by that term. Awesome. Well, I just want to say two things. I think the first one I forgot actually, but the second one is in my tab, so I, I uh, still remember it. Um, so the things that you just went over, I, I read your manifesto, yeah. like the death to boilerplate code. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So I would like, if you are a technical person or you're just interested in the discussion that we're now having, please just go and uh, go to the gadget websites and go to the message from the founders. Uh, it's quite yeah. insane. And it yeah. touches this this exact topic. And it's it's yeah. quite cool. It was a letter we wrote when we started the company. And it was just like how we felt and why we figured that this problem needed to be solved. And it's kind of written as an angry letter titled <laughs> The Boilerplate. And cool. uh, and yes, it's on our website. And anyone can go read it. Nice. Um, you running a company, it's, it's a small tangent again. But um, again, we have a lot of merchants that listen to this podcast so they are business owners them, themselves as well um, how do you hire great talents how do you think about this um we're very picky on hiring i don't think there's a single more important thing uh to control than the people you hire and especially the first 20 people because they set the culture they set the tone and if your company ever grows to a hundred people the first 20 people and their behavior determines the behavior of the next 80 people and the first 100 people determine the behavior of the next 200. So we're very, very picky. We have a uh, long interview process uh, paired with really great salaries. So we pay above market value, but we're also upfront that, you know, getting a job is going to be a bit of a process. Um, it requires full buy-in from all interviewers. So if one interviewer says no, it's a no. We skew heavily towards as few false positives and false negatives as possible. And so we're okay accidentally saying no to a great employee. We are not okay accidentally saying yes to a not great employee. Like we're, we skew to no, 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 very carefully say yes once in a while. So it's usually like four or five interviews. Uh, if you're doing engineering, a couple of pair programming interviews where we give you problems and you work on them in front of us, you ask, answer questions. Culture interview is very important. Uh, frankly, the culture in interview is the first one. And if you don't pass that, it just stops there. And specifically there, when, when I say culture, we're looking for a few characteristics. A big one for us is growth mindset. Right. Like people who, no matter how smart and accomplished you are today, you want to be better uh -huh. next year. Like that's just your personality. It's like, I push myself. I don't need you to push me. And so that's one very key ingredient we look for. Like people who show us that throughout their lives, they have pushed themselves to grow and learn and be better. Uh, work ethic and um, and just kind of uh, team player, teamwork kind of uh, um, mindset. And then finally, ownership mindset. It's like you're here because you care about this product. You believe right. in it. You want it to succeed. And you kind of treat it like your baby. 
the same way I treat it like my baby. Yep. And so uh, the culture interview is also an incredibly important one. And if any of those things is a, even a yellow flag, again, we would rather say no than accidentally say yes. So we're very picky and we take our time with hiring. Um, uh, and uh, my belief is if you can keep the quality bar of your first 25 employees really, really, really high, the system itself just kind of keeps going for and a It will pay out so over the long, long term. Like yeah. A players don't like working with people who are not as good as them. And if you can make sure the first 25 people are kind of like that, they filter out yeah. anyone who doesn't belong, you know, yeah. uh, uh, and you don't have to do it all yourself. You know, have 25 people who are all yeah. of the same opinion. The quality bar for an employee is here. It will not go down. And now you, 25 people are making sure that that's the case. So basically, you're hiring all the best developers of Shopify these days? <laughs> well, we hired five or six of them. I think sure. uh, really, really great ones for key awesome. engineering roles. Uh, you got to be careful with hiring very wealthy employees because uh, this is a startup. And it's yeah. not just about like experience. It's also about effort. You know, there's just like a lot of energy that needs to go into it. So no, five or six uh, people, very senior leadership from Shopify. And then everyone else, we actually try to hire very junior and cool. do the same thing Shopify did, which yeah. is surround nice. them with smart people and train them. Cool. Now that we discussed all of these things, um, so I, mean, I want to be mindful of your time yeah. as well. Um, so let's like move a bit more towards the end of the discussion, I would say. Um, can you... Like name a couple of very cool things that have been built on gadgets. I think it will be awesome for people to hear like what yeah. you are excited about because we're also sure. going to transition a bit more in like e-commerce and what you're excited about there. Obviously tied into what gadget will do in the future, but like more concretely now, like tell us a couple of stories about really cool stuff that has been built on your platform. Sure. Uh, I'm going to, I'll share like a couple of cool apps just because the idea is cool behind them. But then for me, the cool stories are kind of different. So I'll share one after as well. Cool. Um, I think like there's a, there's a couple of applications on the app store and I'll be mindful not to name them specifically. One of them I can name auto. Uh, it's kind of a, a product and blog post generator that uses chat GPT and your store data and. Uh, a couple of thousand merchants use it and like it quite a lot. Um, that application was built in Gadget. Like the team that started it had the idea on the Monday and they submitted it to the Shopify app store on a Friday. What? And uh, for me, that was like one of the biggest stories of like, I can prove to you that you can do something with this product that you can't do with any other product out there where one developer alone in five days built a business that is now installed and paid for by over a thousand merchants on our platform. And for me, that was really validating. Insane. Um, Show Day is an app on the App Store. Uh, it's a video shopping app on the App Store that's powered by Gadget. And that one's exciting for me because it demonstrates how complicated your app can be and still work on our platform. Like often in the early days, one of the critiques that people would throw at us is, oh, you can only build really simple apps with Gadget. Well, go look at Show Day and tell me <laughs> it's that simple because it is really complicated. Cool. Uh, it's installed by a few thousand merchants. It's doing like massive volume. And uh, again, for me, that was like a proof point of like, here, I have something I can show to the world that disproves the critique being lobbied at me. But in all of it, I would say the most exciting stories for me are the ones that validate the Gadget thesis. And at the heart of the gadget thesis is that software should be built faster and cheaper than it currently is, while still being just as perfect as the current tools can produce. So no compromise on quality, 10 times faster, 10 times cheaper. And a couple of examples of this have shown up where one that I'd love to share is there is a shop by plus merchant that was shuttling data from their Shopify store to an ERP, uh, Enterprise Resource Planning Software, I forget the name exactly, through a public app that they had installed from the app store. Did it? A public app was dropping some events. So sometimes it wouldn't catch an order and send it to the ERP. The merchant didn't have a lot of money. They were like, for $1,000, 
can someone build an entire other app that double checks to see if the public app did its job, sent all the orders over or not, which is effectively like build another version of this app, like check all the orders in Shopify, make sure they got to the other side. If they didn't send them again. <laughs> and normally if you see that project on like Upwork and you're a full stack developer, you're like, not a chance I'm doing it for a thousand dollars. Like by the time I set up the infrastructure, like you owe me a thousand dollars. Sure. Uh, and I haven't even written a line of code. But in Gadget, 95% of that problem is the what the platform gives you for $25 a month. Wow. And the amount of work that a developer had to do on top of it was about an hour and a half. So I found a Gadget expert. I told him how to do it, someone who'd been building in our community. And I sent him to the merchant and he did the project and he reported back to me. For me, it would have been an hour and a half. He said it took him three hours. That to me is really validating because it's like that software would not exist in the world if Gadget didn't exist because no developer would pick up that project for $1,000. And in my view, if Gadget is successful in the long term, the net result is not what are developers going to work on. It's like there's already way more ideas that people don't talk to developers about because we've all kind of learned it's expensive. Yeah. But what if Gadget can change people's minds a little bit? And like, maybe it's not as expensive as you thought. Just build it. Maybe you should build the thing for $1,000 and you'll still make $300 an hour, which is a lot of money. Yeah. And maybe the merchant will learn to ask for these things, whereas historically they don't ask for it because they're worried about the cost. If yep. we bring the cost of building software down by 10x, we should see 10 times more software built. And that to me is like the most exciting story is this weird story of like a thousand dollar app that no one was going to build except for a gadget developer because 95% of the problem was just bullshit boilerplate. Super cool. Nice. Thanks a lot for, uh, those, uh, those stories. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe a bit more than broadly about e-commerce as a whole. I mean, you've been spending quite a lot of time in e-commerce, um, we're part of one of the yeah most successful companies in e-commerce lately. I mean, what are you excited about in e-commerce as 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 a whole? Um, I uh, I love the the AI stuff, and Shopify started working on the category of AI stuff that uh, like I'm particularly interested about, which is like small tools to help merchants accomplish certain tasks really really quickly. You know, like yesterday they were like, here is a image background generator for all your Shopify product photos. It's free. <laughs> you know, then they'll probably do another. Here's a blah, blah, blah. It's free. And I think the way I like to think about it is if you were in the Shopify ecosystem for a long time, you might remember in 2017, they had this product called um, Kit. I, I don't know. It. Kit was like a chat thingy that was supposed to be your assistant. Yeah. This is like not 2023 AI technology. This is 2017, 2016. So what it could do was fairly limited and whatnot. But the concept behind it, I really liked, which was like a mom and pop is a lonely entrepreneur. They don't have money to hire people. They need a copywriter. They need a fraud analyst. They need a, you know, background uh, the photographer for their photography. And I think what I see Shopify doing, and I hope they're doing this, is essentially creating AI agents that are your colleagues uh, when you start your business at zero. It's like, here's your photography colleague that you can't wow. afford, but it's actually ChatGPT. Here's your copywriter that you can't afford, but it's actually ChatGPT. Here's your fraud analyst that you can't afford, but it's actually ChatGPT. I'm very excited about that. I think oh, AI crazy. is going to bring the cost of entrepreneurship down dramatically because it's going to let us all have four free employees helping us, you know, and, uh, and I think Shopify is starting to do that. And that's probably the area of e-commerce I am most excited about is like agents that behave as your co-founders when you start Crazy. a business for, for on day zero. 
Nice. Um, are they actually <laughs> building this all on ChatGPT? Oh, yeah, OpenAI software? Do you I, do assume so. you, you, I assume yeah. so. I uh, assume mm-hmm. so. OpenAI does this thing where you can kind of deploy your own models if you buy their enterprise thing, and then they don't share the data with the rest of OpenAI. Yep. So my yep. guess would be they paid OpenAI a million dollars. They train their own models of OpenAI, and they're just Shopify's. But I'm guessing. Uh, I don't know for sure. Cool. Have you been uh, trying out with other platforms or like uh, large language models or not really? Uh, I myself haven't really played with too many other than OpenAI. Uh, We are playing with a few because we're going to do code generation inside Gadget as well. Um, And so uh, we're looking at a few just to see which one is the best for each job. Nice. Um, But myself, no, I mostly largely just played with OpenAI. Nice. Um, I think we can more, more or less finish it right here. We're just about rounding the the hour uh, thing. Um, maybe one last question to just, but I, I think it's going to be more or less what you have been talking about right now. But what are you personally excited about? I mean, um, obviously you build a company yourself, uh, so you're yeah. excited about the company that you're building, but like maybe just sure. a bit off topic or something. <laughs> I'm having a baby. Uh, I'm having a baby next week, a boy, and I'm excited about, uh, and it's my first child, so I'm going to become a father. I'm excited about that. Uh, I would say, honestly, between that and Gadget, all of my time is consumed, so there's nothing else to be excited about, but uh, I'm very excited about... uh, Enjoy both of these things. It's really, really cool. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mo. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much for listening, everyone. I hope you found it super valuable and interesting. If you have any questions, concerns, tips, whatever, please reach out to us via LinkedIn or just via email. You can also reach out to Mo or uh, Gadget uh, on their website, which is gadget.dev, if you have any questions or just want to do some additional research. Thanks again so much for listening and uh, on to the next one.